Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with very good friend, Walt Wagner. Walt and I have been fortunate to be able to travel together and do several projects together. And we just happen to be out here in the wilderness of New Mexico um, on kind of a foggy morning. Yeah. And it's a little cold, yeah, so nice. we've 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 tucked ourselves into the scout camper uh, to have a podcast. Uh, we're actually out here testing a skinny guy camper, spending some time with that as well. But uh, Walt, I've just so admired the work that you have done with the vehicles that you work on, Thanks. and the quality of your team, and the quality of you as an individual. Thank you. So I'm just so grateful to have you on the podcast today, man, Walt. Thanks, man. It's an honor. Yeah. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. Thanks, man. It's an honor. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it really is like, it's, it's been a long time coming, I think, yeah. you know, just finally getting to slow down a little bit and enjoy a cup of coffee and just relax and chat, you know, so exactly. we've talked about doing that for a long time and finally get to the stars aligned. <laughs> we can make it happen. So. Well, and you, you have learned so much, not only in your own travels and your own, the work that you've done as a professional, uh, but then also having now built so many customer vehicles um, through TAV, your company, that you've come away with a lot of insights that I think are really going to be valuable for the listener. But, I, you know, I also want to start off by thanking you for your service. Um, out, of, out of high school, you were in the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. and then yep. you ended up working around nuclear security for many years. Yep. And then uh, you ended up, we'll just call it that you worked for the agency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 the agency. Yeah. Was, yeah. Was, uh, yeah. You know, we could tell you what agency that Walt worked for, but then he'd have to kill all of you. So um, we're going to avoid, we're going to avoid that. Or, yeah. or Walt, actually, Walt <laughs> actually said it may. Have be, somebody after me. Yeah. <laughs> somebody you may camp, come after him. So we're going to leave it at the agency. Um, and uh and then you, what, what led you to decide that you were going to stop doing that work and start working on vehicles? I was, uh, well, having just done, done this kind of travel my entire life, just, you know, ha just taking what I could scrounge up and build a rack for my little samurai, you know, put a canoe on and. You had a samurai? I had a you know, 87 uh, tin top the, you samurai. You just got even cooler. <laughs> it's like somehow <laughs> Walt just got cooler. <laughs> I love tin top samurai. That was my, I might as well have been a five door 110. Or, and aren't or they like a hundred grand now if you try to find oh, one? Man. They're like so expensive. If you can even drive it. You yeah. Know, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's such an amazing little rig. They know? are rad. And yeah. it was, that was my first four wheel drive vehicle. And how cool is that? On our little test drive, the thing spun a rod bearing and it broke down on us. And it was like the guy came down on the price a little bit. So we just fixed it in the driveway. And I drove, when I was in the Coast Guard, I drove it from Philadelphia to North Carolina, back and forth, that little thing. And, you know, because I could just get down on the beaches and just see the family and stuff. So it was, that thing had been everywhere, you know, and it was just such a good little truck. And, and a tin top too. Yeah, man. it was a little tin top, you know, so I was like... I was in heaven. That thing was so great. And well, and even before the Coast Guard, we lived down in Wrightsville Beach on a sailboat and it, we were just on the beach all the time. You know, so we yeah. get around on the north end of Carolina Beach, south, south end of Carolina Beach. And it was like, that was our little escape. That was our little mini safari. You yeah. Know? And just back then you could camp on the beach. You had a bunch of dunes, you know, to kind of hide out of the wind. And it was like uh, the escape from the crowds down there, you know, so having a little four wheel drive was was awesome you know that little samurai was the the best thing ever and that's actually my first memory of 
of like desiring a vehicle of like, of lusting after a vehicle. I don't know how old I was. Cause they, cause Samurai's came out like mid eighties, right? Yeah. Wasn't that about when they first started coming out yeah, to the U S like, it was like Samurai, like two or something like, I can't remember like the designations, but there were some pretty old ones too that, that were like even smaller. You yeah. I can believe that. That's but, right. Uh, but, but I mean, yeah. as far as in the U S when they yeah. sold them in the U S I think they started in the mid or mid to late eighties. Yeah. And I remember I was my dad, this was before I could drive and my dad was taking me to school and we were on the freeway in Southern California and here's this motor home and it's pulling a samurai, a samurai behind <laughs> it. Awesome. But here's yeah. the thing. Like my dad says, I've always wanted to get one of those things. And when you hear your dad say that, yeah, and, you're like, and I'm looking at it and I'm going, yeah, dad, yeah. like that's the coolest <laughs> yeah. damn thing. Yeah. Cause like when you're a little yeah. kid, it's like, it's like the ultimate car. It looks yeah. like something that you looks like your hot wheels yep. and it's getting pulled behind this, this RV. And I, and I remember that, that, that memory, yeah. like it was yesterday. And it was probably the first time that I ever really like lusted after a four wheel drive. And that's why I think I still want, want a Samurai. It's why I drove one across the Silk Road. I mean, it was a Jimny, the newer yeah, version, but, yeah. but, uh, so you started off with, with a Samurai and you started off living in a sailboat. So you want to talk about like, like the school of hard knocks of minimalism. Mm -hmm. Like what did you take away from having to travel out of a vehicle so small and light? It was, um, <clears throat> because I was into riding, I raced BMX and stuff at the same age, you know, growing up and, and, and surfed like we grew up on, on the ocean our entire life. So we had equipment, you know, we had surfboards, a little bit of dive gear, you know, our bikes and stuff like that. So I had to find a way to carry it all, you know, and, and to just take us to where we wanted to go. And we always looked at our cars as in our family, like we had Volkswagen Beetles, you know, and my dad did the same thing. We just yeah. take the family and throw our junk in there and just go camp and stuff. But the car was the tool to get us there so we could carry our equipment with us. Yeah. And we just made do with building a little rack or, or whatever in storage. And it, that was just how we grew up learning how to do that kind of stuff just to carry our own mess around. Yeah, you know? sure. And then, so with a Samurai, now I'm having to cover great distances and, you know, the roof is otherwise empty real estate for, you know, for equipment. So then roof racks come around and, I've, and you have to, you have to run them so light on yeah, a Samurai. Yeah, yeah. Everything's got to be extremely efficient and light and yeah, um, well center of gravity. And then what I found with the Samurai is as soon as you put stuff on the roof, then they, they struggle that much more on the highway yes. because of the wind resistance. Yeah. They think couldn't get out of its own way anyway. Yeah. So you know, by regearing the diffs for a little 31 or 32 inch tire, sure. it did much better, yeah. but still everything's wind resistance over yeah. 55 miles an hour or so. So it, 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 it worked, you know, you know, kid with no money, you yep. know, it, it worked out great. And, but, and like being on the sailboat, you did, you know, a good friend of mine growing up, his dad had a sailboat. They, him and his two, two brothers, him and his his parents, family of five like us, they grew up on that little sailboat. It was a 32-foot Coronado sailboat. Yep. They sailed it to the Bahamas and all around and came back and lived out at uh, Southport over there. And we just became really great friends because my two younger brothers and I were all the same age. And as we got older, you know, they had or had their house and stuff, still had the boat. And I was like, well, I wonder if we could just, you know, rent the boat or something. Let's all go in together. So Josh and Josh and I, we, you know, we all kind of pulled the little bit of money we had and got the fresh water tank resealed and did some work on the boat and sailed it to Riceville Beach and uh, just kind of, we did some work on other boats, you know, scrub boat bottoms and stuff in the yacht club, yacht harbor there and just kind of earned a little bit of a living just so we could be on the water. That's you know? awesome, so Walt. Just learning how to be efficient in our own little ways and learning things. How long did you live on the sailboat? It was, it was probably maybe six months or so. Yeah, sure. It was after high school and I was waiting on getting into the Coast Guard and stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, Josh was able to get in a little sooner than me because I have plates in my arm and that big old fat book at MEPS was like, <laughs> says right here, you can't go in if you have permanent plates or screws. And and I was like, well, you got to be kidding me, right? So yeah. because of that, we were just kind of waiting. So we lived on the sailboat and we fought it. We fought that. And well, my mom did. She wrote our congressman a letter. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they changed it. They let me go back in, and and I before you knew it, I was headed to boot camp, and and then the rest is history. So, 
but that was like just growing up on the water, wanting to stay on the water, which is why we wanted to get in the Coast Guard because we could be on the, you know, so I wanted to do heavy weather search and rescue and the law enforcement side of things. And that was the drive behind it. So both Josh and I did that. And just at a young age. And Josh is your brother. Yeah, he's my younger brother. So you and your brother were both in the Coast Guard together. How cool was that? We were trying to get into boot camp together, but he was just, you know, he was a little bit ahead of me just for the wait time. But but yeah, it was it was fun, you know, because we we can relate on that even today, you know, and, and uh, it's it, it that was just kind of getting our adult life started, and but having having a nautical background just growing up, you know, it really helped out a lot because it, it just teaches you things, it teaches you, you know, just you know, just mechanical. For me, I'm a very mechanical thinker, so it's just a mechanical way of going through life. And it is tying knots and how you know just you know mechanical things work even on a boat uh, and they're so similar it's amazing it's amazing when i was doing the pacific crossing in in kailani the sailboat um you know it's like it's a victron you know on there you know it's a you know it's like it's you know battle born batteries it's like it's the same stuff it is it's the same stuff you know garmin navigation garmin yeah. systems on there and and so it, i felt really comfortable even yeah. though i was a little bit seasick at first yeah i felt really comfortable in the environment because everything looks so familiar the familiarity of it yeah yeah, yeah and, and that's that's what works so well in the expedition industry is is it's got to be vibration proof or weatherproof waterproof dust proof all these yeah these robust systems you know and because like in the ocean, you've got salt and corrosion in different ways, yeah. you know, and sun, you know, you've got all these things that can happen differently. You don't have the high frequency vibrations, but you do still have impacts. Right. Um, like when you're depending on the sea state, man, mm-hmm. it's amazing how stuff can get jarred on a oh, boat. Yeah, it's, it is. It's, and it's, everything is always in motion. Yeah. hundred percent of the time, it, whether it's calm, yep. everything's in motion yeah. in every direction. Yeah. So it, learning how to, how to stow gear and, and even cook underway, you know, it's just a different way of doing things. And, but then when you look at this industry, you can kind of take, you can, there's a very good crossover to all of that stuff. And that was just where, where we were brought up and what we wanted to try to see that if we could offer something just a little bit different in this industry, just with, with our, my background that kind of led into the, the later background, which was an immense amount of driving and, and both in a tactical setting, but then, you know, tractor trailers, you know, any kind of vehicle, you yep. know, and there's a lot of crossover there. And it, the, and even in the coast guard, that's where a lot of my really complex recovery started because I was running a crane on a buoy tender and running, you know, the pulling a buoy up out of the water. Well, the ship is moving. So you're running cross deck winches, compound poles coming up and then across at the same time with on a moving ship, you know, so there you sure. got these different joysticks in front of you literally running a cross deck winch with this one coming up with a crane over here and then running the other one with my chin to try to get the cross deck to pull this way so you're doing all of these things at the same time while watching a spotter wow because the spotter can see on the deck what you can't see running a winch control which carries directly over to a four-wheel drive vehicle it does and And learning to trust your spotter exactly and it's it's one of those things that is so very important when you're driving an off-road truck or, or anything, you know, and understanding how traction works and understanding how certain simple concepts work that can be overcomplicated very easily in a recovery scenario. Yeah. Uh, because you've got all these immense amount of tools to your disposal, well, which one do I grab first? You know, well, well can I just back up? You know, let's start is this there first. Like, why am I stuck? Why am I here? Yep. You know, and it's... A lot of folks want to just get get a little hyped up because now they are not in complete control and they're, and they're feeling embarrassed. Everybody yeah. wants to jump in. That's yeah, right. yeah. They may feel embarrassed or, or whatever the case may be, but they, or they may feel nervous that they're going to get stuck worse. And yeah, right. you see it. People will they'll start to get bogged down. What's the first thing they do? Go to the floor with a throttle. Yeah. So now they're so they just whiskey throttled it. So <laughs> now what was something that they probably could have backed out of? Yeah. Now yeah. they're stuck. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like start off with, can I, can I back up a little bit? Or even before you even start to move, you just back off, you get out. First of all, have I aired down? If I haven't aired down, I'm going to air down right now. Right. Yep. Um, do I have traction boards with me? Yeah. Um, let's get the traction boards underneath the tire. Cause what'll happen is they'll get nervous and then they'll, 
then they'll put it in reverse. They'll try to get out. Now they're dug in even deeper where if they had just stopped and reassessed. Yes, exactly. Let some air out of the tires. Yeah. Let's, let's uh, dig out a little bit from behind the tires so that you don't not have this ramp you're coming up. Let's slide in some traction boards if you've got it. Um, and then the next thing you know, you're out. Yeah. And it was no drama. Yep. Uh, but if you just if you just whiskey throttle the thing, now you're up to the frame, and you're digging. Like and you, you become, got you become a YouTube video. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it's I think it's it's kind of just learning how to think and process through something like that, you know, and understanding the tools that you have, but understanding when to deploy that and yep. And it, it, uh, and understanding the risk that comes with every one of those tools that you use, you know, because yep. like you said, you, like you may have to go through where you just got stuck at, yeah. but if you can stop before destroying the, the environment you're in, whether it's sand or mud or whatever it may be, if you can just stop, reassess and be like, we need to approach this differently, then, then you give yourself that opportunity to do so. Yeah. But you have to have gone through that first to understand that that's what it takes to, to, you know, to get yourself out of a scenario like that or a group of people through, through or out of a scenario like that before you even get into it. Like we yeah. know we're going to have to winch through this, in this spot. There's a huge boulder here that we can, t we can go to. We're going to have to get everybody through here. So we don't just destroy where we're at and yeah, tear up the trail or tear yeah. up the trucks or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, and, and learning all of that, that a lot of that stuff in a very different environment on the water on how, how being complex and, and trying to solve a problem by overcomplicating it, like with all these different compound winching devices, that was a very necessary tool to use for what we were doing. Yeah. So that was common practice, but we did, you didn't always have to do all these different things to pull something out of the water. Same thing with mooring up a ship, you know, you, you've got basically a kinetic rope that a ship is tying to a pier in several different points mm -hmm. because of wind pushing one way or something like that. But that kinetic energy is there for a reason because, and that thing can stretch like in a, a really, really long way. And there's danger zones that you don't want to be in. That's right. And there's a, that is a good tool for that. We literally took our small, you know, inch and a half or one inch, depending on which boat it was, when the coast guard would get rid of some of those mooring lines, we had to throw them away. Well, you can make recovery rope with that. You that's know, what a bubba rope is. That's or any exactly of those what it is. Yeah, what we call a cur in our industry, kinetic energy recovery rope is mm -hmm. is is typically a a, a dynamic mooring line. Yep. Um, and like on my sailboat, I have mooring lines that I use that are dynamic, yep. so that the boat isn't getting jarred constantly mm -hmm. in the, cause you know, the boat is, is in Arizona. We get mon heavy monsoon weather. Yeah. Um, and it can get really kind of whacked around oh, in, yeah. in the slip. So yep. you've got to have some give yeah. around that. And for pulling sure. from all the other angles too, you That's know, right. supporting all sides. And, and it's just like that with, with your four wheel drive vehicle, you know, yep. you, it's, it's way more forgiving and you've used the right way and attached the right way it's an extremely effective tool and, yeah. and a lot of people don't go to that, you know, and, or they go to the wrong thing, like a chain or something like that, you know, and you're destroying other stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's learning all that stuff at a young age, you know, and applying it and seeing it in a very dangerous and real world scenario just started to pave the way for some of that stuff. You know? I can see, I can see Walt, and that's one of the things that I wanted to talk in the podcast today is, one of the things I've really noticed about your projects is that you you focus on reserve capability. I think that as as travelers, as overland travelers, and the more remote we get and the more unpredictable the terrain is that we travel on, that we have to be mindful of, do we have reserve range, which means have we considered how much range we have? Can we get back if the vehicle um, has a mechanical problem or if the trail is completely blocked and we have to go back the direction that we came. A lot of people will think, do I have enough fuel to get from point A to point Z? Mm -hmm. But what happens if along the way, the road is completely washed out or like what just happened in Southern Utah where they had these incredible floods, mm -hmm. um, which not only blew out roads completely or the rivers were so swollen, there was no way to cross them. So you could make it 80% of your way to point Z mm -hmm. and you have to turn around and come back out. So do you have enough, enough fuel to do that? 
and now the now the conditions have gotten so much worse yeah and the and the road's blown out and there's water on the road the wa- the rocks are now wet mm-hmm. and muddy um, do i have reserve capability as well does yeah. the vehicle have enough capability to get me through these kinds of scenarios and then the last thing of course which is the reason why i want to talk with you a little bit later about about full size trucks is reserve capacity mm-hmm. so is the truck is the vehicle right up at the limit of its payload which means um you're you're in you're on a trip with a couple of vehicles one of them breaks down now you got to load it up with extra people yeah. and extra gear are you now way over payload um or does the vehicle that you have have enough reserve capability so what what inspired you to begin to start building because your trucks are unique like they're uniquely yeah. tav like you yeah. <laughs> when you see them you know that it's something that walt and his team put together and it's yeah. kind, you guys are really kind of push the limits on this performance side of things what inspired you to build trucks that way um i i think because i don't like to run a piece of equipment at its max capacity mm. um because if you do need to rely on that thing to go above and beyond, that you want to be able to get that. You don't want to feel like you're constantly at its limit because you don't want your equipment to let you down. And, and that goes with anything you're carrying. Um, so we, we try to think, we, I pretty much just wanted to look at a stock vehicle and what is expected of it. Sure. So when we, when we put gear on a truck, we're adding weight, we're going to add people, we're going to add water, things like that, that will change throughout that trip because you'll go through supplies, you'll go through water, you'll go through fuel. As you're driving, the truck will get lighter, but then you're going to have, you're going to laden it again with fluids, which become very, very heavy, you know, fluids yeah. and it's moving weight in a lot of cases, you know, it'll move around if you don't have, you know, good balance, certain yeah. kind of ballast or, you know, in tanks, but, and roof loads and stuff like that. So I try to think about, I try to put it in a backpacking perspective. If you're physically going to wear something, Put a 40 pound pack on and go walk with a pair of flip flops on over rocky ground and then cover that same distance with a pair of hiking boots on yeah. you as a person are more efficient, you know, or are you going to start less chances you know, of injury? Exactly. You're, you're, you're yeah. the rest of you is going to be more efficient for the long haul. Well, your vehicle's the same way. So if we can address engine output and horsepower in a responsible way without modifying too much of the OEM reliability of that vehicle, then we try to look at that if it's needed. It's not always needed. Mm-hmm. And where you live, too, or where you're traveling, too, it's, you know, out here you could be pulling heavy grades on the highway at altitude. Well, your vehicle naturally is less performance-oriented that way. And you're losing a lot of horsepower and things like that. You know, that to... that's the craziest thing I've noticed about electric vehicles because we've started to test the electric vehicles. They could care less if you're they, at 11,000 yeah, feet. Exactly. Like that... You know, that, that, that Rivian goes zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds at 11,000 feet, (laughs) which is just unbelievable. But it's also like, like the, the camper we're in is on top of my, my GMC and it has a three liter turbo diesel. And I could not believe how enjoyable it was to drive in the mountains of Colorado or like right now you and I are at 8,500 feet. Um, and how much of a joy it is to drive something with a turbo or supercharger. It's like, it's just so much easier. It, it is. And it's easier on the rest of the truck. It's easier than on the rest of your, your equipment. And yeah. you know, you, a lot of times you tell people that we're running a supercharger and they're like, Oh, I don't need that. I'm not, I'm not racing this thing or anything. Well, that's not what we're doing this for. Yeah. And I think that's, what's confusing because when you look at like our Tacoma, that is a, a very complex independent front suspension, long travel, racing component list under that truck, but we're not building pre-runners. Our spring rates are very different. The valving is very different. Mm -hmm. Now the truck does handle speed far better than I expected it to, Mm -hmm. but the truck has to be balanced right for that. And we're carrying equipment that balances a truck because there's a lack of space to put things in very different than what a pre-runner would be. Mm -hmm. And but it's the strength of the component, the serviceability of the c- component, and field fixability of the component that's under that truck. But like the kings that are on that thing, I can rebuild that shock on the bench. And it's not, if you know how to do it, it's not, it's not as complicated or, or painful as people may think it is. Mm-hmm. But 
it, that is such an important aspect of making that thing handle correctly at speed on the highway, down a dirt road, or even just sand. And because you need composure under heavy compression, like when we were in Baja, you got to climb a real long dune. Well, in the middle of that climb, first you're going from gravity pulling you straight down and you're pushing that momentum into a transition at the bottom of a dune. Mm -hmm. So what is your truck going to do when you hit that transition? Sure. And now you're moving up. You're going to be losing speed, creating more drag through sand. So horsepower comes to play through momentum. Momentum and speed are different too, mm -hmm. which people may not understand. But so you don't want to just hit this thing 40 miles an hour, right? You got to kind of ha understand and it's okay to not make it to the top the first time. Just go as... Slow as possible, but fast as necessary. Yeah, I love that old really. Land Rover you know, saying. I it, think it's it a good makes one. Makes so much sense. It does. You know, and having that long travel suspension does allow you to maintain more momentum, it so you can come does. into the dune with more momentum because it can handle that transition. Absolutely yeah. does. And back to the backpacking thing, if you if you're standing on the tailgate of your truck and you <clears throat> are in a squatting position and you go to jump off of your ta your tailgate onto the ground, well, if your legs can only extend halfway you only have that much space to brace for impact. Well, if you can extend your legs all the way, you have twice the amount of length for, to brace for impact and it's smoother on your body. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how that long travel control arms, your legs can work. It moves in a larger radius, so it has more time to brace and, and dampen what's happening on the ground. So when you hit the transition, it soaks that up and keeps your momentum moving up the hill without it just driving the truck into the sand. And then yeah. that dip in the middle, your suspension will ex extend and then compress. And the truck can stay at a more even plane moving that momentum up and through that. And your traction is on the ground where it needs to be. Yeah, because a lot of times when a traditional suspension or a stock vehicle, when it hits a bump like that, you know, there's so little travel that you just get this very heavy rebound. And usually stock vehicles are light on rebound control anyways. Yes. So then you the vehicle bounces up off the face of the dune. Now the tires are in the off air, the ground. which yeah. means that they're going to spin. You've lost traction. You've lost momentum. And you're and slowing down. Next all thing you know, next thing you know, you didn't make you didn't make the climb. Exactly. Now one of the things that I noticed about your vehicles, and I think it's important to talk about with the listener when we talk about adding performance to stock cars, mm -hmm. is it has to be the entire system. One of the things that I'll see oftentimes is someone will put like a rate, like call it a king shock or whatever. They'll put some race style coil over on their vehicle, but they've done nothing else to address um, the stock suspension. So mm -hmm. they'll have they'll have the original jounces on the vehicle, like mm -hmm. rubber, you know, single stage jounces on the vehicle, or they won't upgrade the other suspension components that can be compromised mm -hmm. um, when you start to drive faster. Yeah. So I think one of the keys to it, and I do see that in your builds, is that, all right, you've added, um, you know, improved damping capability. You've addressed the spring rates that you need for the load, but then you'll also add additional suspension travel by going with a wider track um, or a long travel kit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll also see that you'll run progressive jounces yeah. on there or maybe even hydraulic jounces on some of your builds that I've seen. Yeah. Um, so that way you're continuing to address and then you're like, all right, what's the next point of failure? CV axles at those angles. So you, you run stronger CV axles. And then I noticed that you'll run upper control arms that have additional range of motion so that you're not binding up the, the knuckles mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, and the various joints on those components. So at what point do you feel like, um, when you're giving advice to someone that's building a vehicle, how do you help them navigate through that decision process of, am I building for performance? And how do you help them understand that this is a very expensive endeavor? Yeah. Like if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. You can't really go halfway. Mm -hmm even though we see a lot of people do that. Yeah. And, and to no fault of their own, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's, they're going to a facility to buy a component. Well, it's the person at the facility that has to have an understanding of what that person needs. Yeah. And it's, there's, there's a lot of really great companies out there <clears throat> that make really good parts and components, but 
not any one part number out of a catalog for a suspension kit or whatever it may be is right for everyone. Yeah. And most people's needs are, can be very similar, but in, in a lot of cases they're very different. And I didn't want to have like a, a good, better, best approach to what we were doing because I don't feel like it applies that way. Mm. We, we, I, I kind of wanted to set up a stage setup to where like our stage one is a grouping of components that I know work really well together and they're built, they're ordered to work together. Like we, when we order Kings and rad flows, we work with rad flow too. We can do the exact spec of, of coilover or shock based off of what the truck has to do. But that doesn't happen until I've spoken with that person and I know how they're going to use the vehicle. I know what they're going to put on it, how often they're going to drive, where they're going to drive, because that tells me what the truck has to do. But now the spring rate has to be correct for that. So we'll order, if it's a leaf spring, we'll order those springs specific to to what it's got to do but then the shock internals are they the shock companies get a build sheet from us on Mm -hmm. what and this is a baseline to start from because we can if it changes drastically we've been able to pull the shocks off of a vehicle say a camper changes and rebuild them on the bench and revalve them and and even freshen them up wipe wiper seals bearings things like that hose fittings if we need to you can completely build the thing on the bench and it's there for the life of the vehicle sure and it can change as a person's needs change <clears throat> and the trips change over to over time so i want to kind of initially find out how they're going to use this thing so a stage one would be a more of a simple approach a lighter vehicle maybe some bumpers weight that's going to live there all the time on the truck but they they don't plan on having like rooftop tents well even and you could even do that there's a certain kind of balance that i don't want to go past for that particular stage um but it's stock width vehicle we're going to run no larger than like a 33 inch tire on a tacoma or a forerunner a stage one on a tundra you can run a 35 very comfortably and it it absolutely changes the way the truck drives for the good it's it's amazing but yeah there's something about 30 when you once you get to 35s on a full size it, it, everything gets so much easier. It's crazy. It, Ride quality <clears throat> gets better. Yeah, on the pave and on yeah. the pavement too. Like everywhere, it just it it's it's what's physically touching the ground. So yeah. if that can support what what is above it, then that's that's it's all about support. And, yeah, you know, I've noticed. And I've stuff. noticed on the on the GMC. As soon as I got thirty fives on the truck, it just it does so much better on the trail. It does mm-hmm. so much better <clears throat> on corrugations because it's a larger diameter mm-hmm. tire. Um, so it just, the, when I air it down, the ride quality improves so much more. Which translates into the rest of the vehicle. It it really does. It really does. And, and I think, I think that the same is true for 37s on a full size forties become complicated. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they aren't a good choice for some people. I think that they really are. Uh, but it starts to get complicated because the vehicle gets so huge Mm -hmm. that you can't kind of drive traditional trails with it yeah but yeah and, and yeah and, and it absolutely depends on the the platform that it's on and it, yep. it's got to make sense yep. you know and, and it can it, it absolutely can make sense but it's 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 got to be considered for what the truck has to do like does that size make sense for for what this truck's going to be and what mm-hmm. it's going to do and because it makes them incredibly capable oh yeah like if you if you see like a prospector xl on 40s like on the trail in moab it's incredible oh, and air down too it's like it's incredible yeah. where they're well the where they will go um it's just important to remember that you have now a much wider vehicle mm-hmm. so there are trails that are just going to be it's going to be too tight yeah um so just kind of going into that knowing which is a, another big thing about like the long travel stuff, you know, yeah. like the stage one is, is stock width, the long travel, um, like our stage two is, we'll use a Tacoma for instance, Tacoma and, and Forerunner are pretty similar. Um, it's like, it's two and a half, it's two inches wider per side. And th- that's just the components that we use, you know, through Total Chaos and their arms, their control arms are two inches longer. The, there's a steering, there's a, a, a spacer that goes on your tie rod. Everything is just lengthened two sure. inches per side. And so your track width now is just a little bit wider, but there's, there's a lot of pros that come with that. We can lessen our CV angles. Oh, and, sure. And like, if you look at my Tacoma, yeah, the CV axles are longer. Yeah, they're longer. So it's a larger radius sure. that it moves in. So you don't have to, so when people look at lift, you know, it's, we don't lift a vehicle to say three inches. 
the Tacoma on 37s is at zero inches of lift, it's just adjusted in a way to support its weight at a certain height. Yeah. It's zeroed out, kind of like zeroing a rifle scope, say, for 100 yards. Sure. My point of aim and point of impact needs to be at 100 yards, so you're zeroing your scope for that, and you can zero a scope for 1,000 yards. Same thing with our spring rates, or what the truck has to do. If it's on 33s, it's zeroed at a certain natural stance is a little taller because the tire is taller and the spring rate is heavier. So the truck's not going to sag under its own load sure. as much. But you can have preload on a coilover the exact same amount. But if that spring rate is heavier or less, the truck's going to naturally stand higher or lower. So we make that proportionate for the load that's on the truck, the tire size that has to move a certain amount of inches in compression from stance from way it stands to a certain amount of inches of extension we want to be somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. so you have room for compression when you hit something or you have room for extension when you hit something but a lot of people with these mid travel systems it's stock width but when you preload that to get your lift yeah, you have almost no extension travel it points your control arms down yeah. which now that radius is shortened because it can't point any further down and the leverage is on it is also very high because you have you have high. to get it to, to start to compress. Correct. And then you have so little extension travel, you're constantly topping out. And, and the ride, the ride quality is terrible. Yes. So yeah, and making sure that you don't overlift the vehicle. Like, like for example, on my truck, I, I do plan on upgrading the shocks here in the, ne in the very near future, <laughs> but it's not so I can drive any faster. I mean, I've got my house on the back of it, yeah, so right. I'm not going to drive any faster. I just want it to manage the load better. And yeah. I'm actually not going to add I mean, I may end up adding maybe about 20 mil a lift. It'll mm -hmm. be about 20 mil taller, um, but uh, just... Which is very reasonable. Yeah, which That's, is a really small amount. Yeah. Because this truck is already two inches taller on, from the factory. Right. The AT4 has a two-inch lift. So I don't want it to be... It'll be end up being about two and a half inches a lift. Right. Over a standard GMC. But what I do need is much better damping. Yeah. And I need more fluid volume mm -hmm. uh, because these ranchos that are on here, they just aren't working. They yeah. just, they don't control the load. They're fine in a stock vehicle, but, um, I need something with firmer val valving, mm -hmm. um, so that I can manage the load. And that's why I'm changing the suspension. But I think helping people understand that if you put an improved suspension on a, on a stock vehicle and you haven't changed the track width, you're not putting that suspension on there to drive faster. Right. You're putting that suspension on there to manage the load better and to be more comfortable. And if you do make a mistake as a driver, which we all we all do, yep. Yep. Um, we all write a check that maybe we can't cash right. sometimes. Yeah. And you do have a hard hit. You have some of that re reserve performance. Uh, but what what I see oftentimes is is that people will just add a coil over onto their Tacoma and they now think that they've got a pre-runner. It is the furthest thing from a right. pre-runner. Yeah. You know, yeah. all you've done is you've just given yourself a little bit more capability right. when things go wrong. Yeah. You're yeah, you're exactly right. I think there's a misconception there that like, well, I've got kings on this thing or I've been running rad flows on this thing. I can I can blast through whatever. Well, no, that's not there's a lot that goes into oh, yeah. making a truck handle itself right at speed and, and, and balance and things like that and, and composure. It may be the exact same, like a king on a stage one is the same quality king as on a trophy truck. It's yep. just different dimensions. Right. You know, and some some added components on, on that, like bypass tubes and things like that. But overall, it's the same materials, mm -hmm. you know, that, that make it the quality that it is. It's intended use is different. And, For sure. And it's, it's a... I mean, a, a shock can be a science project in itself. Like, there's so much I need to learn about high performance use of a of a of a shock. But with what we're doing here, we've we've found a balance that works so well in our industry, with like a like the Scout Camper on one of our stage ton, one tundras that we've done for for a client. We knew the weight that was going to go into it, but with a truck, weight can change drastically it just can. by taking it out of the bed. Yeah, and the truck right. still has to handle right. Right. Every truck we build has to be a daily driver. Mm -hmm. It just has to be. and Because most people do use them absolutely. in that way. Yeah, and they got to be safe and comfortable and you know on today's highways and roads, but then you want to be able to rely on that to take you out into the, uh, into the bush. So there is a fine line to, to walk there when you talk, start talking about long travel stuff, but it can be done, you know, and that's in the spring rates and the valving and stuff like that. But it's like kind of going back to the good, better, best, 
a lot of folks think that, man, I got to have your stage three because that's, that's got all the best stuff on it. Well, it's just in an addition of a component. You can have a stage one and work your way all the way up to a stage three. The stage mm-hmm. three just kind of collectively groups engine performance, drivetrain, which is in the gearing, and that's when we can introduce lockers. Um, this, all of these suspension components, you know, in, in the long travel stuff, in some cases, like on a Forerunner or a Tacoma, it's a new rear axle altogether. It's a Ford 9-inch that still uses a Toyota unit bearing, so the speed sensors and ABS work like it should, so there's no lights on in the dash. But the diff is a much, much stronger ring gear. Much, mm-hmm. It's almost twice as thick as a Toyota ring gear. It's, it's insane because I had a catastrophic failure over time that did not know what was going on until we were down in Baja, and it spit a ring gear bolt out of the housing. Because that's over, exciting. Over, yeah, that was a blast. <laughs> but you, and then it allows you to address track width at the same time, so you can too. match yeah. the width. Because a lot of times people will just put a spacer in the back axle, yeah. um, which in general is not a not the great it, greatest it, solution. It, it works in some cases. In but. some cases, yeah. If used right, it can be very strong. But I've seen a lot of people put like really wide spacers and stuff like on the front. Yeah. Because when they preload their mid travel system and they want to fit a thirty five. Well, I'm going to put a two inch spacer or something on the front to, because when you do that, it draws your track width under the truck. That's right. So they try to space that back out. And now your scrub radius on your steering is all thrown out of whack and you're hitting all kinds of other things. But like, so like on our Tacoma, I've got a full width Ford nine inch housing, but I've got a one inch billet spacer to make the track width almost identical to the front. And I can yeah. fine tune that. Mm hmm. The strength in that is, I, well, we put one on in somebody's Forerunner, and it's it's stronger than the axle it's mounted to. Yeah. Like they got hit in a T-boned in an intersection. It ripped the axle out from under the truck, and the the housing was destroyed, but the spacer was fine. I mean, that billet spacer, if it's the right kind, yep. is using the same lug stud that's on the truck. Sure. And it, uh, But the spacer itself is a machined piece that's stronger sure. than what it's bolted to. So, but if used properly, it, it's, it's a, it's a good tool to be used, but it's got to be used the right way. And especially and, in the front. And that's something that's important. Which for we pe- won't do in the front. Yeah. It's know. important for people that are listening to understand what happens when you put a spacer on the front. Um, modern independent suspension is designed to have positive offset on the wheels um, because we want the wheels to be inside the flange because when, like, for example, when we get close to the edge of a road or we're on a snowy road and we get into loamy soil or if we get into, into deeper snow, <clears throat> if you have a negative offset or if the wheels are pushed Way out outside, or spaced out, yeah. it's going to grab the wheel and it's going to pull you into the ditch. It creates a lot of leverage. <clears throat> That's right. There's an enormous <laughs> amount of leverage and it's going to pull you into the ditch. Whereas if you have positive offset, which means that the majority of the tire in the wheel is inside of that flange when you hit that soft material it's actually going to push you away Mm -hmm. from that it's actually going to that resistance is going to hit that wheel and it's actually going to force the wheel and the the vehicle out of that scenario Um, so it's a huge safety issue when i see people running um, negative offset wheels i don't know i think that they just used to do that with old cjs and stuff and maybe it's a legacy of that but there's a reason why wheels are positive offset and they stick in, they, they push inside, um, the wheel well like that. And the, and the, and the wheel is very flat and there's not a lot of, of negative offset and it's a safety issue. Mm-hmm. And so when I see people run in spacers on the front, it's one of the most dangerous things you can do, yeah. um, for the handling of a vehicle. Yeah. And yeah, and it, it is. And, and another thing, the tires bigger too. So you've yeah. got more contact patch on the ground, which right. is going to want to grab whatever's under it. That's you right. Know? And it's that's why it's, it's and uh, another thing too like if somebody's going to run an aftermarket wheel a lot of the aftermarket wheel companies the oem wheel is a certain width bead to bead mm-hmm. and when they want to run a bigger tire you can be up against your control arms and mm-hmm. lo- physically scrubbing on the control arm on your yeah. sidewall which is not be good horrific, yeah, not you good know? so the wheel companies because the width is bead to bead is a little wider like eight inch or like nine inch some of like 10, 12 inches deep, yeah. these massive wheels, but that that's where, it, what can change your offset as well in backspacing and all of those things. But like with method, they method race wheels, they have that bead grip technology. I that like holds that. that bead, but they don't make that wheel anything different than a zero offset 
but you kind of have to with the width because now the bead has changed width. That's true. So the the dimensions of the wheel are still in a responsible range to where it's not going to want to track the way a really deep offset wheel would be, yep. especially with a larger tire. It gets your tire away from your suspension components. It's still close, but it's not it's not too close. It's not touching. And it's one of the reasons why I love to run a narrower wheel with a narrower tire, narrower tire run yeah. as tall of a tire as I can, right. but it allows me to maintain that positive offset on the wheel mm -hmm. for safety and stability. Um, but because it's a narrower tire, I can run it on a narrower wheel. Right. Without um, getting into your That's right. Components. I don't like to run much wider than eight, eight and a half inch oh, wide yeah. wheel. Yeah. Um, same here. And, and there's also, even if you run a little bit wider tire, there's advantages. Now you may get a little bit of accelerated crowning and wear, but there's some advantages on running a narrower wheel because it the, the tire is less likely to come off the bead. Mm -hmm. um, it also keeps the tire very narrow. Um, mm -hmm. So just, just being careful not to run uh, too wide of a wheel and being careful not to run too much um, offset. Um, so you want it to have lots of positive offset, which means it's Pushing it's more up underneath, pushing you know, it it's supportive. That's right, inside yeah. of the 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 mounting flange, yep. uh, for sure. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to to chat about on the Tacomas because you've built so many Tacomas up. If you were to talk about, like, let's say somebody just went out and got a 2022 TRD Tacoma, uh, or maybe they at least got an SR5 so they get the rear locker. Um, what is, what is kind of the build that you would recommend for most overlanders? Like what would, how would you address, um, like, let's say you bought one just right now and you were building it for yourself to go travel in and you were planning on drive, driving around all around a lot in Mexico and you didn't want too many, too many components that you can't get replacements to. How would you build a truck like that? If, uh, if I was kind of new, new to that kind of traveling or if I was kind of new to the, you know, what kind of gear to use and all that stuff i would just say put a good tire on it and go yeah tire is physically touching the ground just put good traction on the ground and just go you know just put gear in your truck your clothes whatever kind of tent you've got or even if you have to stay in a hotel just go travel just yeah. go just try to find out what your what would drive you to want to go and travel if you just hate the being in the weather if it's raining or windy or whatever it's just inconvenient uncomfortable you know, there's ways you can get out into nature and be comfortable, but you kind of have to have your trip and your vehicle tell you what is required next. What's falling short. And, yeah. And like us this morning, yeah, it's crappy weather outside. We're nice and cozy yeah, I, yeah. inside a hard shell yeah, camper. It be windy and snowing outside yeah. right now, but we're, we're good to go, yeah. you know, and it's, it depends on the need of the individual. It absolutely sure. does. And uh, I think because man, look at the little beat up little rigs running around down in su southern baja you know yep. and they they go everywhere you know and you can do it all these other countries that have just old mercedes cars just running around everywhere two-wheel drive yep you know and it can be done and i think in our minds we're like i want to know that my truck can do it whether i'll do it or not i just want to know that it can and there's there that's that can be okay but then that people can get carried away with that too you know and it's it's not you know, we're not here to just throw a bunch of components on a truck and sell it because we can. If I built out a fully built truck for somebody and they have no budget, right? They just go go crazy with it, right? I've had somebody say, I want you to throw the whole catalog at this truck. I'm like, but I can't do that. Like, yeah. I, don't, like I don't even know what you like to do, you know? Like, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to try to build you something that I have no idea what it's going to do. Yeah. So... I'm just, I, I kind of really got to know how they're going to use that thing. And I just tell them to find, if somebody's shopping for a vehicle, I, I, whether it's an SUV or a truck, I kind of try to dig into that a little bit and find out which one would be right for them and just get the trim level that they like. Cause certain trim levels like TRD pro has a certain color to it. Right. So if you like the color and it fits in your budget, get that, get this, the seat trim you like, the interior things you like. Because those are things that, that we're not going to be changing. Sure. You know? So get what you like there. And the TRD, let's say a TRD Pro, everybody thinks that a TRD Pro is just the shocks. And it's not. I yeah, mean, there's, there's skid plates. There's and, skid plates. Yeah. There's wheel designs. There's colors. There's trim level on the inside. There's a lot going on to it. 
And if they did pull the TRD Pro stuff off, they could sell that like that to somebody that's got an SR5. Yeah, it all bolts on. And yeah, and then just switch it right over. Mm -hmm. So it's not a loss. They Mm -hmm. think like, oh, I'm going to spend all the extra money on a TRD Pro and I'm wasting it all. That is absolutely not the case. Yeah. You know, and somebody's going to want the, that some, Fox suspension. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's, you know, it's a lot of people have done that because they want the color of the vehicle or mm-hmm. the interior trim and, and we can build off of that. You know, it's, it, the components are mostly the same. The one big difference is a forerunner with KDSS and then, or, or without it, there's ways we can still make the KDSS work. If it's long travel, then we just bypass it and we do a mechanical sway bar in the rear and, it handles amazingly, you know, because all of our spring rates are heavier anyway. Sure. So, but, you know, a lot of folks are like, well, should I get it with or without KDSS? I, I mean, it, it's it's all, a lot of that's personal preference, but it's, that's, I think, kind of going back to your question is, if somebody just doesn't know or what I would recommend first is just put a quality tire on it and just get out and drive and explore and, and enjoy it for that. And then, Put the equipment on the truck. If you're if you're going to be putting stuff on the vehicle, I would start with whatever camping equipment you're going to use, what you're going to carry with you. Put the weight on the vehicle first, because then you're going to, it's going to tell you immediately that maybe your shock dampening is too soft, or your spring rates are too soft. But as you're doing that, and you're going to put a couple hundred pounds of bumpers on the front and back of the vehicle, then we can look at what kind of weight's going to live on the vehicle, and then we can we can address the spring rates and the shock valving and stuff like that. So. Yeah, smart. You know, it's just, it's not what everybody wants to hear because somebody buys a car, they want to lift wheels and tires because mm-hmm. it drastically changes the way the truck looks. But yeah. the look can come with it in the end if you make it work right. And I think that's, like you said, there was a certain kind of look with the trucks that we're building. We're not building a truck to be in your face and like, look at me and this is a loud, you know, a, you know, approach to a expedition truck. Like, I want to build it to work. Like old Camel Trophy trucks, old Defenders they were stock. And Discoveries and stuff. They were stock, stock. Yeah. and they had roof racks and all this gear all over <laughs> them. They were built for a challenge. They yeah. were built to navigate and get through certain things. Well, that's where that people started to build for a look of that. Mm-hmm. And if you continue to just build the truck to carry your equipment and the gear and things like that to work right, then that look will come with it. And it's just a harder way of getting that look. You know, getting and it's that in, it's interesting how little we need when I. When I started driving this full size truck, um, and we're going to talk about full size trucks in a second, but you know, I I had not driven full size. I'd never owned one, yeah. so I thought, you know what, I'm going to take my own advice and I'm going to do nothing to this truck yeah. at first. Yeah. And I did. I drove it stock, and I drove it off road stock, and I towed with it stock, and then I realized, okay, it does need a, a slightly taller tire. Mm-hmm. So then I went to about a 33. And I still wasn't happy with the tire diameter. And I'm like, I wonder if I can fit a 35, 10, 50 on there. And this, this truck that's underneath us right now, it, it's a stock vehicle other than the 35, 10, 50s on AEV wheels. But I am realizing now that the, the, the Rancho shocks, they're under dampened for the mm-hmm. truck and the weight yeah. that I have on here. Cause I'm right. I'm right at gross vehicle weight rating. Uh, but because I'm right at gross vehicle weight rating, I can't add any other modifications. I can't add a winch. I right. can't add bumpers uh, because otherwise I'll be over on payload, which mm-hmm. is something that I think is really important to stay under. So it's like, you're right. By taking it step by step and learning as we go along, we do recognize that, like, first of all, we don't need half as much as we thought we needed. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and also, like, all of that stuff costs money. So it yeah. takes us away from from yeah, traveling exactly, and spending yeah. money on gas and tacos and stuff like that. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. 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 And gas is a big issue. It right is. Now. It's expe- an expensive it's, part of a tr- it, any trip. It's an expensive thing. So, yeah. um, you yourself have started to migrate from Tacomas and smaller vehicles, uh, to the full size trucks. Uh, what did you feel was the, the motivation for you to make that change? I think because we have to use, we have to use these trucks as a, uh, a tool like we've got to do hauling like i've got to be able to put a truck on a trailer Mm -hmm. and haul it and when we first got the tacoma that was the only pickup truck we had so we built it to support the weight that was on it but we were usually traveling for like to set up at a show so we were carrying way more stuff than we would normally camp with pulling a trailer with gear in it stuff like that but i was just killing the vehicle like i knew it wasn't set up or designed to do that but we had it was all we had you know, so to travel around and do these vents and stuff like that. 
but when we would travel to camp and explore, we were far, we were way lighter, you know, and because a lot of times we'll go somewhere, we'll see something we want to bring home with us. We want to have somewhere to put it, yeah, you know, sure. and, and it's fun to be able to do that, you know, a piece of driftwood or yeah. something, you know, and you want to throw it on the roof rack. A lot of times our roof rack's empty. Like on the Tacoma, there's one Zargus case with recovery gear in it. The other side's got max tracks on it, but I can throw those anywhere, yeah. you know, and I've got real estate for my piece of driftwood. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Know, or, or anything. Yeah, you know? sure. And, um, like on the Ram, the roof rack is completely empty. So it, it's just usable square footage that's like keeps the truck light because we're not just loading it down with stuff that we might use one day. Now, recovery gear is different. You know, there's stuff that should go with you. Um, but to a certain extent, you know, I like to plan or pack per trip because every trip is a little different. Sure. It's just what my background was. We couldn't take stuff that didn't do anything. It had to, it had to perform either our duties or our personal gear, like clothing, you know, for the mm -hmm. trip. And that was kind of it. Yeah. So this is really no different. And that's the same approach I'm trying to take. Like on our Tacoma, we've got that, the Bowen custom bed now with all those compartments. Well, I think half of them are empty because yeah. I, I don't have enough stuff to put in them. I have yeah. a house battery in one for the camper, air hoses in one, and I have a couple tool rolls in one, but all the other ones are, are empty. And it's nice because... Yeah, you, you don't have to fill up all yeah, the space. Exactly. You it, really it, don't. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's what a lot of people like to do because they can create... There's so many good companies that make drawer systems and all these different things that create usable storage... If there's an open space, they'll fill it, you know, and yeah, that's the old Parkinson's law that <laughs> bureaucracies and overland vehicles will be filled to their capacity. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's, yeah, we got to be able to, to say, we're going to leave this stuff at home. Yeah. But I, I do think that the, we're seeing more and more migration to full size right, vehicles to because, uh, the payload mm -hmm. of, a even a three quarter ton Ram, for example, can be twice that of a Tacoma mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go to a one ton Ram, it can be the whole weight of the Tacoma yeah, can be, exactly, can yeah. be the payload of the truck. Right. Uh, so yeah. these, and these, these full size vehicles um, with the aftermarket support that we have now, uh, they're more capable than they ever have been. Yeah. And I think a lot of people forget that uh, the major 99.9% .9 of trails in this country are driven by full size trucks. Mm -hmm. What what is the Forest Service driving around? Full size. They're trucks. driving around a full yep. size truck. Yep. When you go along the border, what's the Border Patrol driving? Yep. Full. Sometimes they do drive jeeps. Right. But for the most part, they drive power wagons mm -hmm. around full size trucks. Yeah. Um, and if you see fish and game out and about, what are they driving? Full size trucks. So there are trails, no question, that are they're rock crawling trails. They're yeah. extreme trails. And those are designed for much smaller vehicles yeah. overall. But the majority of traveling routes that we're going to do in the backcountry mm -hmm. are designed for a full-size truck. Yeah. You may end up with a little bit more pinstriping, right. but for the most part, they'll fit. And they're not doing any additional damage to the trail because they're already being driven uh, by ranchers and, exactly, yeah. and people, and hunters that have full-size trucks. Yep. Um, so I think that in general, um, unless you need... Um, the ultimate performance of a smaller vehicle um, that you're probably better off with the capacity of a full size. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, I think a lot of people have migrated from the forerunner and Tacoma platform to like the Tundra or, or even like the, the bigger diesel trucks, mm -hmm. if, you know, if they feel like they're pulling it, you know, a lot of these camper trailers and stuff now, these that are off-road capable are, they're, they're massive, they're big, you know, they're and big. yeah, they're super nice. And, Anytime you make something a little bigger, you can fit something else that's nicer in it. So people are finding that I can still get very, fairly remote and have a super nice camper. Now the whole family wants to go, well, you're going to need a full-size truck to do that and the right kind of full-size truck. So, And another cool application I'm seeing more and more of, like Paul May from Equipped is doing this um, and Matt Swartz, who does some editorial contributions for us, you know, they've got these high, high performance, full size trucks. Like Paul's got a Tundra, Matt Swartz has got a, a 2,500 Ram. Uh, so they can, they can pull their Airstreams yeah. and they've got their home with them yep. and super comfortable. Mm -hmm. They can park it in a campground, but then they can unhook 
the full size truck. Yep. And like Matt's got, he's got a, a Super Pacific mm-hmm. camper on his on it's on thirty sevens and AEV, all the goodies, um, and he can go as far in the back country as he wants, and then come back and yep. tow the airstream to the next spot. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because a lot of people will want to carry dirt bikes yep. or something in the bed of the truck. And that, that can add weight, you know, I mean, they're, they're heavy. They are heavy. Yeah. Know? So they'll carry dirt bikes and, and gear and people. And then you can have like a, like an Airstream or one of those like off-road trailers. And Some of them are awesome. Yeah. I mean, they're, they've, it's a, it, like this past event over in the Expo uh, Mountain West was a whole row of more off-road oriented type RVs. It was impressive. You know? It was, impressive. yeah, it was pretty, pretty crazy to see who's coming to the table now mm-hmm. with that kind of stuff and the capabilities you know, and it's not just, you know, from Australia or South Africa anymore. It's, there's a lot of stuff built here in the U.S. that's yep. like that, too. And in the U.S., you can see very drastic differences in terrain, you know, especially in the four corner states. Right. You know, and, but then you can be on both the east and west coast and see what that's like. And you can do all of those things with, like, one of those trailers, you know, for the most part. Yeah, but that's you amazing. you the right kind of truck to take you two days down I-40. That's right. To get there. You yeah. Know, and, and they're so comfortable. These full size trucks are so comfortable. <laughs> They'll spoil you, man. They're just you're just yeah. like I don't know. I feel like it's a total Cadillac. I mean, it's like my. I mean, I can turn on the air conditioned seats exactly. and everything else. I feel I'm just getting I'm getting soft, Walt. I know. I'm getting, we got to get back in the FJ40s. Yeah, stuff. we got to get back. We got to get back in our FJ40s and give our spine an adjustment. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You know, Walt. I I so appreciate. It's amazing. We we're already at an hour talking oh, yeah. about this stuff, but. I, I so appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Um, TAV is is uh, very thought. You guys are very thoughtful about how you support your customers, mm-hmm. um, and you build some of the coolest damn trucks that that I've seen in the industry. How do people find out more about you and TAV? We, we it's very important for for me personally to be face to face. I try to get out to as many as like we do all the Overland Expos because that's a place for everybody to collective you know brands and then people to get together to to be face to face with and see this stuff in person so we try to do that as much as we can um and we try to travel like we want to see people out in the field um social media is a huge help for a small business like us like uh, instagram you know at tav try to make it simple at tav llc on instagram uh, my buddy Matt is our marketing director. He he does a great job. He does a, an amazing job, and uh, you know he's he's trying to get to paint the right picture and still make it entertaining. You know it's it's uh, we're try it's we're trying to just be as educational as we can. Sure. Um, so it's very important to have that interaction, and we just we try to do our best. You know it, it's uh, just to relate with everybody that we can, and we're always going to work hard for you. You know and and just try to get what you need if it's not going to be you know if it's just not something that we would feel comfortable doing it's not any disrespect or anything i'll try and get the right person involved for you on a build but there's a very specific way we're trying to go about this yeah. and um and to t- keep our name attached to it i want it to stay consistent and stay yeah. within our wheelhouse on what we're doing um but like you know youtube for us is is literally a means of just trying to educate folks on what we just did on this build like from front to back because that will resonate with someone. And we, Josh and I literally just did it with a cell phone and, you know, we're just trying to great. answer questions and, you know, and get that. And people seem to love it, you know, and, and it helps build us up like, okay, cool. People are liking this. So we're not wasting our time. Right. Yeah. So, because we wanted to answer the questions, but I couldn't keep up with the different places they were coming in at. Yeah, sure. So if I can just do that in a vid- quick video, um, you know, and Matt's trying to get that edited a little bit better to where it's not so painful to watch, but he's, he's doing a great job on that, you know, and it's, we're trying to graduate from just a cell phone, you know, video, but it's really just there to get information out. And, no, you guys are and, doing, you guys are doing such a great job of that. And so making sure that people follow you on, on social media as well and, and get in touch with you if they've got some questions, but, yeah. you know, and I think one of the things I want to close with, and it was before we, we started this conversation, but we, you know, we've both lost our moms in the mm-hmm. last couple of years. Yeah. And you said something to me that I think I, I just want the audience to hear, but you said that every time you hugged your mom, you hugged her like it was the last time you were going to yeah. hug her. And I think that for those that are listening, maybe think about that the next time you see your mom 
or your dad or your uncle, aunt, whoever in your life that you really care about, um, remember to hug them like it's the last time you might do that because Everyone we don't, you're close to. Yeah. Cause we don't know, we don't know, uh, what's going to come next. And a lot of us are traveling. We travel for long periods of time. We may not see our loved ones for months at a time. And it's just so important, uh, that we hug the people in our life. Yep. Um, like it's the last time we're going to see them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's something that it can just be taken for granted, you know, and we, everyone just gets so busy in their yep. lives and work and travel and things like that. It's just important to kind of rein your brain back in and, and hold that kind of stuff dear, you know, and yep. it's, uh, cause you can't undo it. Yeah. And a lot yeah, of us are doing this it. so we can spend time with our families that's you right. know? And, and we're, we invest everything we have in our life to be with our families. And, and that's, that that part of it is is the pinnacle you know that yeah, is the most important part it is the most you know, important so the relationships that we have in our life so thank you all for listening remember hold the people that you love a little tighter next time and uh we'll see you out there on the trails that's right thanks for listening yeah thank you